Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am here live on Instagram. I'm Hank Philippi Ryan and hoping I'm also live on Facebook. Um, Facebook seems to be thinking about it now. Um, this is not 11.30 a.m. on Thursday Eastern Time. This is actually now it is 12.30 or so Eastern Time, but we are bringing First Chapter Fun to you today at a special time. Uh, because we had incredible technical di difficulties on our first go around this morning at 11.30 a.m. where we were all here, but uh, the system did not quite want us to have this work perfectly today, so we will have it work perfectly again. Uh, the show must go on, and Roy Fryrich, our wonderful author today, um, we are reading from Deprivation, his truly scary summer novel, which if you are getting ready for a day at the beach today, um, you might just want to give that a little second thought and spend today at least this half hour with me, Hank Philippi Ryan, and my partner in crime, Hannah Mary McKinnon, um, as we read you the first chapter, as we always do, of a wonderful new book. So I am live right here on Instagram and right here on Facebook, and I welcome you all to uh, this special time for being on First Chapter Fun. Thank you all for being here at 11.30 earlier this morning to witness the meltdown of First Chapter Fun where every technical thing possibly that could go wrong did go wrong. So we just decided we would um, start over and make this be perfect because Roy Fryrich's book, Deprivation, is completely wonderful. So I know uh, Jen was here and Deborah was here and Sharon and Tracy and all of the wonderful uh, people who Bonner and Elizabeth and Karen and everybody who is always here was here and Hannah Mary was is also here um, cheering us on and Roy Fryrich um, who wrote the wonderful deprivation that we're reading from this morning um, also here to listen to his really terrific book. So I hope you are all well. I hope you are all safe. One of the wonderful things about First Chapter Fun is having this community, right? This community of readers and writers and people who care about books and care about stories. It's always safe inside a story, we always say. And um, this is proof of that. You know, when I'm looking for something wonderful in the pandemic, which is very difficult to do, this sense of community that Hannah Mary McKinnon has created at First Chapter Fun, and I joined her sort of midway, um, is really one of the joys of both of our lives, and very grateful now to be here. To continue with episode 81 of First Chapter Fun, and as I said, we're reading this morning from Deprivation, the fabulous summer book by Roy Fryrich, and if you are getting ready to go to the beach, as I said, you might want to hang around and hear the first chapter of this novel. It is quite terrific and thoughtful and brilliant and unique and incredibly well written and brings you right in. So it is quite a perfect summer book or any time book to remind you of a summer vacation that you will be happy that you did not take. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Roy Fryrich because his, his bio is unbelievably impressive, quite astonishing. Uh, Roy Fryrich leads multiple lives as a writer of lyrics, movies, and novels. His lyrics have been sung by legends Aretha Franklin, Smokey Robinson, and Patti LaBelle, among many others. He's written screenplays for Fox, Searchlight, DreamWorks, Warner Brothers, and Sony, and adapted his novel Winged Creatures for the film Fragments, featuring Forrest Whitaker, Dakota Fanning, Guy Pearce, Joss Hutcherson, and Kate Beckinsale. So that is quite a lineup. He has also served as editor for the National Desk of the New York Times and for the renowned Beloit Poetry Journal. He lives with his wife, the ever patient editor and frequent co-writer Deborah in Malibu, California. Together, they've written the libretto for a musical adaptation of Anne Rice's Cry to Heaven for Seattle's Fifth Avenue Theater. And you can visit him online, and I know you will, at RoyFryrich.com. So now, this is we're reading today from Deprivation by Roy Fryrich, with the kind permission of Meerkat Press and the author himself, for which we are very grateful. And let me tell you a little bit about 
deprivation, which is for sale, available right now, and I know you will run, want to run right out and get it. Not right now, of course, but after you hear the first chapter, you will want it even more. So let me tell you a little bit about deprivation. After a mysterious, silent child is found abandoned on the beach, clutching a handheld video game, residents and tourists alike find themselves utterly unable to sleep. Exhaustion impairs judgment, delusions become hysteria, and mob rule explodes into shocking violence. Told from three perspectives, Chief of Police Mays tries to keep order. Teenaged tourist Court and her friends compete in a dangerous social media contest for the most hours awake, while local physician and former Harvard psychiatrist Dr. Sam Carlson battles his guilt over a student's suicide and the blurriness of his own insomnia to try to treat the sleepless until he and the child must flee the violent mob that blames the child for the epidemic. And did you hear that beat? That was just Hannah uh, leaving me a message, which I will now talk to her later about. Turn off the phone. Okay, turn off the phone. Is this not fun? This is a day that every technical thing that could possibly go wrong is going to go wrong. I'm going to ignore, ignore the phone and read you, finally, the first chapter of The Brilliant Deprivation by Rory Fryrich. So it begins with a wonderful prologue, um, which sort of takes you into Karatuk Island, into this wonderful island where we've all been, or we've all read about islands like this, Nantucket or Block Island or Martha's Vineyard, where there is a real push-pull during the summer between the summer people and uh, the townies, the people who live there year-round, who have this sort of conflict, the, the affluent summer people come, and that's what provides them jobs. But the summer people are a little bit pushy sometimes and a little bit arrogant sometimes and a little bit feeling that they've spent all of this money and now, by golly, they are going to have things the way they want. So it is in this atmosphere that we begin chapter one, which is called Day Four. Karatuk Island's local surfers like to call themselves the Dawn Patrol. When they find the boy standing mute and staring seaward, day has barely begun on their pale stretch of beach or across the lanes of share houses or at the Bay Haven Marina where Sam lies aching in the bunk of his forward cabin, watching the deck hatch brighten above him. The sheets cling, dank, damp with humidity, a hint of mildew under the tang of bleach. It's already too hot too airless. Weighing the throb in his head against last night's excesses, he's lucky to feel no worse. Was it three or four plastic cupfuls of Chateau Neuf de Pop? After the half joint, the hour of easy chatter and laughs, and another of enthusiastic sex, he had lain back and waited and waited for the usual dependable sounds, the idle slosh of current on keel the creak of dock lines in cleats to lull him into unconsciousness and a few blessed hours of forgetting. He would turn over to face the close mahogany wall along his bunk just to trade the pressure on one hip and shoulder for the other, but he might wake Kathy there beside him, her sleep deep and trusting, beautiful to see. His own eludes him too often of late but from triple shifts at med school to the wakeful nights of these past months, he's learned to hope a kind of purposeful drifting can almost work and end the endlessness, if only for a while. Unbidden randomly, the faces of the summer patients come back to him. The tourists gathered at Karatuk's day clinic in jams and jeans and faux batik beach wraps with an ear infection or heaves from a bad steamer clam or alcohol poisoning. Most present with a sheepish sense of their maladies as minor or self-inflicted, the Hannah or Heather with itching mosquito bites, Frank from Rhode Island with an angry sunburn, tipsy college kid Max with a foot cut on horseshoe crab's broken shell. More than the usual absent regard, though, lately a few seem to offer a commiserating look, 
as if for a kindred, weary soul, or maybe worse, almost a kind of recognition in glances met and slid away. And what about that other girl, the plain-faced teenager, Cindy or Cynthia, in for a headache, whose pupils, when he checked, seems to darken and dilate, as if some faintest shadow had passed between them. Stoned, likely, and who wouldn't want to be at her age, trapped in an Airbnb with her parents bored or bickering. Faint chiming begins. His cell? He climbs quickly, silently out of bed. Kathy barely stirs beside him, one ankle nudging her other's tattooed bracelet of thorns as he pads naked through the cabin and its flutter of lats, nights, detritus. Where is it? He spots and plucks the little cell from where he has forgotten it on the companionway shelf and answers with a finger swipe. From its tiny speaker, as it sometimes has over the past few days, a wave of static surges and disappears. A word becomes audible like something surfacing, a question. Sam? It's Paula, his clinic nurse, voice, voice harsh, too loud and too soon on this day to bring good news. I admit it. He does a half turn, aiming his lowered voice out the cabin door so Kathy can sleep in her luxury since quitting her waitress job at the local coffee spot. Sorry to rush you this morning. The line is clear now, her voice sharp. But we got a little boy here, surfers found on the beach, alone. He won't talk or can't. An image floating up, silhouettes against the gleam of the ocean, lending a smaller away. The lost child found. Not news in a summer resort town like Pines Beach, but a boy with a disability or purposely silent suggests more amiss. Huh, his parents? Nothing, Sam. Who he belongs to, where he's staying, nothing. He bolted a cup of noodles and a bag of chips, but he shied at a washcloth. He makes his eyes wide, rubs the bridge of his nose. On my way. Say hi to Kathy. He clicks off and behind him, she appears. A glimpse of nude hip by the stateroom door. Her wry, sleepy eyes and teasing smile. What you got? Bee sting, sunburn? He hesitates, torn, but grabs her sweatshirt from the dinette and flings it across to her. Hi to Kathy, he says. Sam rushes his routine, skipping the shave and finding a tee in cargo shorts. Unimpressive, but clean enough for work. Kathy's already set for her morning. Iced coffee in one hand, e-reader with destination Tuscany queued up in the other the little galley TV tuned to the view when Sam bends to brush her lips with his own and a small hint of lingering. I realized I've got it all wrong, she says. I'm supposed to be a pining away on the shore for you while you take to the deep blue sea. We've got it all wrong. They trade their crooked smiles and he heads up the cockpit steps to work the tarnished latch and open up on gray white daylight blinking as his eyes adjust. The world sharpens into horizontals and verticals, stays and masts and blue canvas covered furled mainsails. Down the long multi-fingered float of Bay Haven Marina, 50 odd slips filled this time of year by weekenders from Greenport, Nantucket, Hyannis. He steps into the day from the cockpit onto the deck to leap a bit jarringly down to the float he climbs onto his rusting five-speed rudge and piddles up the ramp for the dock, sun warm on his back. Through the open gate, he, guide, he glides onto the quay where tourists are slowed as usual in idle groups before Caratuck's kitschy clip joints, ogling the same stacked t-shirts and coffee mugs, the laminated faux nautical charts, the cheap bikinis and Chinese Ray-Ban knockoffs, there's enough belly fat for twice as many people here on what looks like a whole bowling team, outer borough or Jersey commuters with Bluetooth headsets and big showy laughs, taking their summer ease from middle-class city jobs, police, transit, fire. A clutch of teenagers whispers urgent business, probably trading pot for Ritalin or mom's flexoril or just gossip, 
who's back this year, who's hooking up, who's a total bitch, or forever unforgivable, just lame. A few of his clients back in Boston were teens suffering the slings and arrows of high school, anointed or exiled on a dime, self-medicating with anything handy or hiding in their cluttered bedrooms, tweaking their online profiles, counting their friends and followers, lost in the data cloud. Among these, the girls of summer stand giggling, 15 or 16 year olds with salty tangled hair, mahogany tans, fleeing childhood and the uniform of the day, cutoffs and unbuttoned baggy sheer shirt over a two piece, flip flops, rawhide bracelet, nude lip gloss. He recognizes one he treated weeks ago, Cordy or Cody? Was it food poisoning? Smirking and aggrieved, redolent of menthol cigarettes, her mother had dragged in the mortified girl who I, whose eyes now find his again in a fleeting glance. Her hand tips vaguely upward before she's nudged by a girlfriend and they all bend closer to a cell phone one holds, exclaiming, oh my God, could I just die, please? Oh, oh my God, I could have gone so longer. Whatever it means, they crowd in twitching with the eager joys of bragging rights of schadenfreude. As Sam passes, a tourist in pricey Gore-Tex walking gear, everything but the goofy ski poles it seems, chides the barista of the coffee spot window in stagey, confiding tones. Hey, I know it isn't Starbucks, but that latte yesterday wasn't decaf. My fiance was up all night. Just a heads up between us, right? Sam's heard a thousand iterations of it, the uneasy tolerance between sulky islanders trapped in service jobs and finicky demanding tourists who have planned and saved for a few days of having their way right now and just so. No time for the usual iced grande at the coffee spot today. Sam presses on. Dr. Sam, hey, a voice flo floats out mild and lilting and Sam lifts a hand in casual wave to Carlo, slouched in his beach chair under his striped umbrella beside his cooler cart of bottled water and ices. Now he coasts by a pair of local fishermen, Dwayne and Hank, both too leathery looking before their time, Sam sunblasted as boys on their dad's charter boat, chumming off the stern without a shirt or hat in halcyon days before anyone connected sun and melanoma. After a last hundred yards of sandy lane past stands of dusty bayberry and mildewed bungalows, Sam pulls up along outside the clinic with its peeling sign, Pines Beach Urgent Care. He leans his bike against the rough hewn cedar siding and through the plate glass store window. The, plate was, the place was another kitschy gift shop before the township eminent domained it. He can already see medtech Andrew laughing into the phone behind the check-in counter and nurse Paula nowhere in sight, probably in an extra room debriefing the foundling's embarrassed contrite parents. Inside the waiting room is empty. Magazines are scattered, the place could use a dusting, and the TV silently displays a commercial for nothing short of happiness, apparently. A mom and dad and child in their kitchen, high-fiving, waving, laughing. The image freezes and scatters, solid-colored squares flicker, and then the picture recovers and becomes a talk show. After just a few months on the island, Sam already knows a gull has built its nest in the island's cable TV head end again, probably, or someone needs to check the TV inputs for corrosion, not for the first time. Andrew, as usual, ducks his head and whispers last words into the phone with a sideways nod. Sam pauses to wash up, then steps around the doorway of exam one to see Paula and the boy there. In shapeless scrubs and her glasses on a chain, she's a trim, black, non, no-nonsense 61-year-old from Medford, uh, ever on alert, always appraising. The boy's skin is smudged with grime, his hair dark and matted with sweat, but his eyes stop Sam with a look Sam knows, haunted from someplace well past grief. 
Well, we've made friends, I guess. Paula peers over her glasses at Sam, but he doesn't want to tell us who he is or write it down, do you? She smiles winningly back at the boy whose gaze has never left Sam's and now holds a glint of something deeper, unsettling, almost accusing. Sam's shoulders tense, an odd reflex he shakes off, trying a smile of his own. That so? Can't get you to write anything down? The boy's silence is filled, it seems, with other sounds. The phone gen gently ringing out the admittance counter, a murmur of voices there, the distant sign of the ocean a few sandy lanes away, broad and deep, but barely audible. Sam eyes the comma of grime crossing the boy's sheep cheek, the smudge on the side of his neck, and turns to yank on the exam room sink tap and adjust the temperature. Maybe we'll just clean you up a little for now. How's that sound? Sam, Paula's warning voice spins him back. The boy cringes there, wide-eyed and gasping at the gush of water bursting from the faucet. Sam flashes out a hand to slam it off. He smiles, too fast, too big, or not. Later works, too. He and Paula trade a glance that at once suggests and agrees on the likely but vague initial diagnosis trauma, and what that first requires, slow, careful going. As if in agreement, the boy has reached into his shorts pocket and pulled out his black little rectangle of a handheld electronic game. He grips it like it's something ready to fly off, and the gaze he turns to Sam now beseeches. It's a relief for a moment at least. Any semblance of normalcy is welcome for any sense of calm it might restore. Sam nods and pitches his voice soothingly. Hmm, one of those, sure. Sam looks closer at the inert thing. Looks like the batteries are... He checks himself. Let's see if we can find you some new ones. It is such a wonderful opening first chapter so full of portent and so scary. And Roy Fryrich has this wonderful way of taking things that are utterly, utterly normal and making them feel creepy and multi-leveled and subtext. And I can tell you that in that first chapter alone, the first chapter of deprivation alone, there are so many amazing bits of foreshadowing that you would never know had you not known what the book is about. So Hannah and I highly recommend Deprivation by Roy Fryrich. It is a wonderful page turning, brilliantly written, great elegantly written, sophisticated, creepy, timely, contemporary thriller. It will keep you turning the pages until late until the night and then have you seeing if you too are sleepless and wondering why. So that is Roy Fryrich's deprivation, which we are so thrilled to have read to you just the first chapter. And I know you won't be able to stop. Doesn't that sound great? Ali is saying, I love it. And Glenny is saying, I love it. And so many people are joining now on Instagram. We are thrilled with that. Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you. And thank you for joining us today on this special edition of First Chapter Fun. Now, let me say again that on Tuesday, we will be reading from Deborah Crombie's A Bitter Feast a wonderful British police procedural. Deborah Crombie is quite a genius at police procedurals, and this is book number 16 or 17 in her Duncan and Gemma series. If you love British police procedurals, and who doesn't, who doesn't love modern Scotland Yard, and a detective who has a family, and this one in particular, A Bitter Feast, is about what happens at a gorgeously catered event. So there is murder and food and mystery and families and you will love Duncan and Gemma a bitter feast by Deborah Crombie and we will be reading uh, that to you the first chapter and I hope you get hooked on Deborah Crombie she is quite a rock star on Tuesday on first chapter fun so again thank you for joining us at this special time we hope you loved as we did the brilliant first chapter of Roy Fryrich's deprivation. I hope you will run right out and get it. And you can go right now because First Chapter Fun is over for the day. We are so grateful 
to all of you for being here today at this very special time. But we know so many people watch the videos of First Chapter Fun, which you can find 81 now episodes here on Instagram and IGTV and here on Facebook in our video library. 81 first chapters so far and Hannah and I have planned far into the future to bring you more wonderful first chapters all through the fall and winter and on into the spring and who knows how long after that. So until then, um, grab a good book. What new book will you discover? We hope today you discovered Deprivation by Roy Fryeridge. Until Tuesday, we say to you, stay safe, stay kind, and read something wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today.